Okay, so uh, let's uh, start. Uh, so uh, there is this idea of flipped cl classroom. So in a normal classroom, um, you uh, have lecture in class and you have uh, homework at home. And in the flipped classroom, it's the opposite. You have a uh, lecture at home and uh, um, you have a uh, homework in class. And uh, um, I teach at Stanford GSB now. And we use that uh, flip classroom with uh, MBAs a little bit. And so I decided to do this a little bit here as well. So in this session, uh, there will be you know, some exercises. And you know, I'll ask you to spend a little bit of time you know, working things out. Um, and uh, so, but of course, the other, the flipped part of that is uh, um, on the Princeton Initiative website, there were uh, some, uh, uh, there are some videos. Uh, so let me ask you, how many of you have watched a little bit of those videos? Okay. Wow, all of you, all of you have, have watched. That's really, really, really impressive. Uh, um, but I'm going to review some of the uh, key parts of those videos anyways, um, in order to um, you know, make it um, you know, as, as efficient as possible. Um, and uh, I would say that the, the key uh, relationship uh, from the videos, the most important video, uh, is one that Marcus, uh, the idea that Marcus has also mentioned is this uh, asset pricing idea. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, so I'll explain it in a moment, but this asset pricing idea uh, allows you to solve 60% uh, uh, of a macrofinance model. Okay. So more than, more than half. And, and uh, the rest, um, you know, there are some other things that you have to do. Okay, so uh, this asset pricing idea is that uh, you can price assets from uh, uh, consumption of individual uh, agents. Okay, uh, so if you have a, a, um, a consumption process for somebody, you take the discounted marginal utility, um, and you can use that as a stochastic discount factor to price uh, assets. And this is, a, this is an important idea in uh, asset pricing, and uh, I've learned this back in graduate school in uh, Daryl Duffy's class. Um, so the stochastic discount factor times the value of uh, any self-financing trading strategy. So a self-financing trading strategy is any time that uh, whenever you receive the dividends, you reinvest them. So this is just how... Um, uh, your uh, wealth can grow um, if you don't take anything out. So this product has to be a martingale. And this is the, uh, the key idea of this asset pricing relationship. Okay? Um, and uh, the fact that it's a martingale, it's basically an uh, optimality condition for an, for an agent. Because if this is not a martingale, it means that the agent is not optimizing uh, uh, by uh, allocating money between uh, current consumption and uh, various investments. So this is, for example, um, not a martingale, but if it goes up in expectation, then it means that this agent uh, would be getting higher marginal utility in the future. So instead, he would have to uh, uh, consume a little bit less today and save a little bit more, and uh, uh, so that would violate optimality. So this is just a uh, an optimality condition, okay? And uh, so uh, this is a martingale. Uh, in terms of algebra, if you use Ito's formula, it means that if you uh, take process C, the stochastic discount factor, and, and uh, this process for asset value, and we, uh, uh, we compute the drift of the product, then uh, the drift of the product by Ito's formula has this form, and th this has to be 0. Okay? Um, and uh, so this is something that we can use. Um, and if you just look at this expression, then, well, uh, so there is this mu uh, C, which is uh, um, maybe we don't know what this is. So then uh, that's OK, because we can still use this uh, expression even if you don't know what is mu xi, if you just apply it to, to two assets. Uh, so we have uh, this uh, equation for asset A and the same equation for asset B. And if you subtract, then we get, have an equation uh, that we can use that doesn't involve this term mu xi. Um, 
And uh, if asset B is uh, uh, the risk-free asset, so, so then uh, this is the expected return on uh, uh, asset B. This would be the risk-free rate. Then we get uh, this expression. Uh, and then uh, uh, we see that uh, the uh, drift of the stochastic discount factor has to be minus the risk-free rate uh, and uh, uh, um, minus the volatility of the stochastic discount factor. This is called the price of risk. So uh, the excess return that you get from asset A over the risk-free rate equals the amount of risk that you have in asset A uh, times the price of risk, which is minus the uh, volatility of the stochastic discount factor. Okay? Um, and when I learned this as a graduate student, well, I thought that, well, this is just, you know, this is just uh, uh, for asset pricing. So this is just for uh, discounting future cash flows. Uh, but it turns out that this relationship is useful in many other ways. So it's used you know, for asset pricing, for finding the value of something. And in a broader context, if we have a macro model, this is also useful for solving for the allocation of assets. Okay? Because uh, we use this asset pricing equation for one agent, but we can also use it for many different agents who you know, bid in the market for the different assets, which will determine the allocation of assets. Um, as well as the allocation of risk, how much risk different uh, uh, um, individuals, intermediaries, and you know, uh, and borrowers, how much they would want to hold. So this is useful for determining the allocation of assets. Um, and then, believe it or not, this is also useful for uh, you know solving for the the evolution of the whole system, how the wealth distribution evolves, right? Because if you find the asset allocation then uh, this tells us about uh, how much risk every single individual is taking. Um, but for the risk that they take, they earn um, some return. And that return is given by the asset pricing relationship on the previous slide. So therefore, we can solve for it for how their wealth is going to evolve as a function of the uh, return that they're going to get. And so you see that this is useful. Uh, uh, in many different ways. And uh, next, I want to give some examples um, of how this asset pricing relationship is useful for uh, finding the value, is useful for finding asset allocation, is useful for uh, uh, solving for the evolution of wealth distribution in a macro model. Um, and what I'm going towards is um, I'm going towards you know, eventually asking you to um, do this on, on a simple model that can be solved, in fact, in closed form. Okay, but, but first, uh, all the steps that I'll ask you to do, you know, I will um, uh, do them in another context. Okay, so the first is just like a very classic example of uh, using it for valuation. So here's a very simple model. So imagine you have a representative agent economy. Uh, so many, a continuum of agents, each one has a, a CRRA utility. So uh, with risk aversion coefficient gamma, margin, discount to marginal utility is just that. Okay. And uh, suppose that in this economy there is a single um, asset that pays uh, initially dividend D0. So it's you know, distributed somehow. Uh, each, each of these continuum agents holds a small fraction of that. Um, and this is growing at rate G, and uh, uh, um, it also has risk sigma. Um, and uh, suppose I ask you the question, well, uh, find uh, the price of this asset and find the risk-free rate uh, in this economy. So there is also, you could imagine, the risk-free asset uh, in this economy in zero net supply. So, uh, these individuals could borrow or lend uh, at the, the risk-free rate, but because they're all identical, uh, they wouldn't uh, hold a positive or negative amount of the risk-free asset. So, you know, how you would solve something like this using um, using this relationship? Okay. So you know, so. 
Uh, I'm not going to ask you to solve it, but I'm going, I'm going to pause here and I'm going to ask you, you know, if, uh, I'm going to, um, so I'm not going to ask you to solve it, but I want to pause here and I want you to think about, uh, uh, you know, how you would personally approach and, and, and solve it. Like, ask yourself the question, can you actually use the asset pricing relationship, which I'm going to write down in a moment. So it's mu A plus mu C plus sigma A sigma C equals zero. So can you use this relationship to, to answer this question? Find the uh, asset price and risk-free rate. So I'll pause for about you know, a minute, just think about it for a moment, and then I will show you how to do it. Okay, so um, you know, I gave you a moment to think about it. Now let's uh, talk about it. So we have this formula, okay? Um, and now, um, in order to answer that question, well, uh, we have to use it, so we have to put things uh, into it, right? Um, so we'll have to put something for the uh, expected return on this asset. And what's the expected return on this asset? Well, that's going to be the capital gains rate G plus the um, dividend yield, which is the dividend rate divided by the price, and the price is the unknown that you know, we'll, we'll have to find through this equation. Okay? Um, and then um, what else we have in this formula? Well, we have the risk, so the risk is given. And then we have uh, um, uh, those two terms that we somehow have to find uh, from consumption of these agents. Okay. And what that they're consuming, well, they're just co going to be consuming the, the total dividends. So uh, consumption equals the dividends. We have a process for that. And so that, that way we can, we can solve it. So if, let's, let's see. So uh, consumption equals the dividend. So we have the process for consumption. Okay. Um, and then uh, um, we want the process for marginal utility. Okay, this is the, uh, and to find the process for marginal utility, we uh, use Ito's formula. Okay, so this is just, you know, math. I'm sure, you know, all of you can, you know, go through the motions and actually, you know, derive it. Um, you know, maybe not like instantly, but, you know, if you carefully go through it, I'm sure uh, all of you can do it. Uh, and then, um, and, and this, is, this, is, this is the return on the asset. So this is the unknown price, OK? Uh, so then uh, uh, if you just use this formula, then what we have is we have um, the um, expected return on the asset. Um, we have the drift of marginal utility minus rho because, because it has to be discounted. Uh, and then we have the product of the volatility of marginal utility and uh, the volatility of the asset, okay? And this formula, we can solve it for uh, Q0 and get the answer for what is the asset price. That's the only unknown in this formula. And then we know that the uh, drift of uh, uh, the SDF is minus the risk-free rate, so this answers the other question about the risk-free rate. Okay, so that's you know nice simple exercise uh, to warm up. Okay, uh, and I guess one remark that the no this note is reminding me I should make is uh, in case, for example, gamma equals one, this is the special uh, log utility case. Um, I think in Marcus's uh, lecture there was a question about it. So if we plug in um, gamma equal to 1, then let's see what do we get. Then um, these two terms cancel out, OK? And uh, uh, these two terms cancel out. 
and therefore you get that this uh, this ratio equals rho. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, an individual with logarithmic utility is going to consume um, uh, rho times well. Okay, this is a fact that's always true about uh, logarithmic utility. Okay, so so this is just a, a valuation, and. Uh, um, I promise that I'm going to illustrate um, all of those bullet points, how to use this uh, relationship for finding, for example, asset allocation is the next bullet point. So uh, for finding the allocation of assets, I'm going to use this um, a model from online lectures. Um, and this model is based on a, a paper that I wrote with Marcus called the, a macroeconomic model with the financial sector. Um, let me just uh, spend a couple of moments to remind you uh, how this model works. Um, uh, so there is some amount of capital in the economy. Um, and uh, uh, individuals can create more capital through investment. There is an investment function with uh, some adjustment costs. So this, is, this function phi is concave. Uh, delta is the depreciation rate. So capital depreciates. And there are some shocks to capital. That's the hurricane that uh, Marcus has uh, talked about in his lecture. Um, so um, and. Experts and households, they can use uh, capital uh, productively to generate some output, but experts are more productive than households. So the output that experts generate is uh, uh, A times K, well, A per unit of capital. Um, and some of this output is used for investment uh, to produce new capital. And then for households, uh, for them, it's A lower bar instead of A. So households are less productive than experts. Um, so experts, let's say, have CRRA utility with discount rate rho. Households have a uh, um, uh, discount rate rho underlined um, less than rho. So the experts are less patient than the households. Um, and uh, so you could do that, or you could have a model where some of the experts die or some, some switching. Um, and uh, the financial friction is, uh, in this model, is that the, when the experts, when they hold capital, or households likewise, um, they have to absorb at least a fraction of the risk that, uh, of the capital that they hold. Okay, so uh, holding capital exposes them to risk. And potentially, they could issue some equity and offload uh, uh, some of the risk to other agents. But there is a constraint on how much risk uh, uh, can be offloaded. So uh, experts, they have to keep at least a fraction uh, chi underlined of risk. Okay, And then um, in this model, we can talk about the uh, price of capital, how it evolves. Uh, we can talk about uh, uh, the in potentially endogenous risk, so that the price of capital is uh, uh, changing depending on uh, macroeconomic conditions, depending on how the wealth distribution uh, evolves. We can talk about uh, uh, what this endogenous risk looks like um, in times when there are fire sales, when experts sell some of the capital to households, versus in normal times when uh, capital is allocated efficiently and experts uh, hold 100% of capital, we can talk about uh, all of those things. Okay, but but this is the model, and uh, um, I'm going to use this model to um, illustrate how to use the asset pricing relationship to find the allocation of capital. So the question about allocation is, um, is going to be this. So uh, let's assume that we have logarithmic utility. And let's uh, assume that uh, experts cannot issue any equity. So um, whenever this is a simple assumption, which is that if experts hold all of the capital, if experts hold some capital, then they have to 
uh, absorb um, the entire risk of this capital. And the question is about allocation. What equation describes the fraction of uh, capital held by experts? Okay. Now, um, how to use the asset pricing relationship to, to get that? Um, So um, people like to work with logarithmic utility. Um, and uh, the reason people like to work with logarithmic utility is this um, relationship that I already mentioned earlier, that uh, consumption uh, equals rho times wealth. Okay, And you uh, see it uh, on top of this slide here. Um, you know, this creates a lot of um, convenient analytical uh, properties of logarithmic utility. Um, and this relationship tells us that um, consumption is proportional to wealth. And therefore, for any uh, individual, the volatility of consumption equals the volatility of wealth. So what does it mean? It means that if wealth goes up by 5%, consumption also goes up by 1%. By five percent, so this is relative volatility in percentages. Okay, it's it's not it's not to say that if wealth goes up by thousand dollars, consumption goes up by thousand dollars. No, it means that if this goes up by five percent, that also goes up by five percent. Okay, um, so it's relative volatility, not absolute volatility in dollar terms. So um, this is the volatility of marginal utility, and the marginal utility for log is one over c. Okay, and uh, uh, if the volatility of uh, consumption is you know uh, plus five percent, then the volatility of uh, one over c is you know minus five percent. So you know, so, so basically, you know what this means. Um, and uh, now the risk of capital is sigma plus sigma q. Okay, because um, The value of capital is Q times K. And uh, sigma is the risk of K. And sigma Q is the risk of Q. Uh, so Marcus says, you know, we just postulate this process, right? Um, so using either product rule, uh, the volatility of the product is just the, the sum of volatilities. This is the volatility of capital, including endogenous risk. And then if experts, if their wealth share is eta, um, and if uh, they hold a fraction of capital psi, um, then uh, this is their leverage ratio. Uh, leverage amplifies volatility. So this is going to be the volatility of their portfolio. This is going to be the volatility of their wealth. And therefore, we have uh, um, this relationship. Okay. So uh, of course. Uh, the price of risk is uh, minus the volatility of marginal utility. So that cancels out this minus sign. And this is just going to be the volatility of wealth equals the price of risk for a log utility agent. So this is the price of risk for um, experts. Um, so the asset pricing relationship that they promised we are going to be using over and over again to derive uh, a lot of the very useful things is to find the allocation of capital. We have to use the asset pricing relationship for uh, experts and for households. We are finding the allocation of capital between experts and households. And therefore, we have an asset pricing relationship for experts. And we have an asset pricing relationship for households. And so we have two equations uh, to use in order to find um, the, the allocation of capital. So for experts, it's uh, well, it's, it's the expected return on capital, which has uh, a dividend yield uh, output that you get divided by the price plus the capital gains rate. So there's some algebra here, but they don't have to write it out because for uh, for households, it's going to be the same. Uh, minus, let's say the the risk-free rate. So this is actually um, mu a minus R f. Uh, plus sigma a sigma c 
equal zero. So this was one of the relationships on that, on that slide earlier. Um, this is the risk of uh, capital. And this is the price of risk for a log utility agent. Okay. And that's for experts. And then we can write an analogous equation for households. Um, and what's going to be different for households is that they will have a different uh, dividend yield because they're less productive at using capital. This is the risk that they face um, when they hold capital and they have to uh, absorb it. Um, and this is um, if this is the term for, for the experts, then for the households, this is analogous. Their uh, the fraction of capital they hold is one minus psi, and their wealth share is one minus eta, and therefore uh, this is the um, volatility of marginal utility of households. Okay, and then if you have these two equations, we can solve for psi. And how? Well, we just have to take one and subtract the other. And then we have uh, uh, this equation, which gives us uh, you know, psi. Okay, so this is, uh, so of course, uh, you can uh, uh, look at this equation and you can say, well, some things are still unknown because uh, you know, Q is, you know, we have to somehow determine Q. You have to somehow determine you know, uh, sigma Q. Uh, but I'm going to come back to those questions um, in a little bit. Okay? So this is using uh, the same asset pricing relationship. So you know, of course, there are different versions of it. You could put the risk-free rate, whatever, uh, to find uh, the allocation of capital. Um, and then, of course, once you get this equation, um, then you have to look at it and to say that, well, you know, this is actually only true for the case when uh, um, both experts and households, they hold a positive amount of capital. So this is only true when psi is a bit strictly between 0 and 1. Okay? So then you also have corner cases, but if you apply this equation and, and let's say you, if you get psi equals 1.5, then you know that psi has to be equal to 1. So OK, um, so I promised that we are going to use the asset pricing relationship to find uh, um, the price of capital, to find the allocation of capital, and also to find uh, how wealth uh, evolves over time. And so here, let me talk about how to find uh, how to use the asset pricing relationship to actually solve for how the economy evolves for the evolution of wealth uh, distribution. Okay. Um, so, the, the, so, so this one, I um, already had it on the previous slide. And um, so in fact, on this slide, I'm going to use a lot of things that uh, we have already derived here. So we know how much risk uh, experts face, and we know how much risk the households face, because that follows from this uh, um, equation which determines the allocation. Okay. So if you know how much risk experts face, and you know how much risk the households face, then um, we can use the asset pricing relationship to determine, well, if, if you know how much risk somebody faces, then you know how much uh, excess return they have to have over the risk-free rate. Okay. So, so therefore, we can write the equation for the law of motion of uh, the wealth of experts. So they, um, so the law of motion of wealth is an individual earns the risk-free rate plus takes some, some risk and earns uh, the risk premium on that risk. And also uh, consumes something out of wealth. So this is the basic equation for the law of motion of wealth. So we take um, the risk-free rate. We subtract um, how much the individual consumes out of wealth. And we add 
the risk that the individual takes. Uh, and the price of risk is that for every single DZ, the individual also earns this much. This is the price of risk. Okay? Um, and the price of risk is uh, we obtain it from, uh, um, from this equation because this tells us that, well, the price of risk uh, is, is just the uh, volatility minus the volatility of marginal utility, which is, which is that. So we have this equation for experts. We have, th we have this equation for households. And this is you know, completely analogous that this is the risk that the households uh, take. And this is the um, compensation for risk that they have to earn according to this asset pricing relationship. Okay. And now you see that um, you can use these two equations to derive the law of motion of eta. Um, and, and how? Well, you know, use eta's formula for the ratio. And when, when you apply eta's formula for the ratio, this one unknown, the, the risk-free rate, will actually cancel out. And then we get, we get the equation. And I'm not going to go through the algebra because you know, um, I'm sure all of you can do it carefully if you spend, you know, I don't know, five minutes, 15 minutes, half, half an hour. But <laughs> but the point is the point is that it's 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 completely doable. There is no mystery there. You just have to be careful with the algebra. And if you're as bad at algebra as me, then you have to do it over and over again and, and check everything. And <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, you have a question. Um, did you change measure here? Um, I did not change measure. No. No. Yeah. Okay. I did not change. I did not change. No. This is this is. Um, but the asset pricing condition, the one that you have on the blackboard, mm -hmm. and you set the drift of the pricing uh, dynamics equal to zero, are you, you are not changing measure, right? Uh, I'm not changing measure. No, I'm not changing measure. So when you do this ETO product, it looks really similar to when you change measure to feel the drift, and then from P you go to Q or something else. At least that's what I have in mind when I see this. Right. So uh, yeah, I, I think what you're talking about. So I'm not changing measure many, uh, changing measure anywhere here at all. Uh, but I, since you're bringing this up, I want to uh, point something out uh, and see if there are any follow-up questions. That uh, um, in um, asset pricing, there is this concept of risk-neutral measure, right? Um, and I'm not using it here, but just to make a connection with that, that um, the, uh, so th this uh, stochastic discount factor, one way th that it works is, um, let's say that you have value v0. And then uh, equals the expectation of, uh, let's say, CT, VT, uh, let's say, um, I think, divided by. So this, uh, this, is the, this, is the, this is discounting. So you have this value today, and you're discounting some value in the future. right? Uh, so um, what they do in finance is that this ratio can be decomposed into um, the product of just like straight discounting, e minus, let's say, um, uh, r times t. This is the risk-free rate. Uh, and um, some Martingale process. And this Martingale process can be uh, a change of measure process for uh, changing between uh, physical probability measure and the risk neutral probability measure, right? And, and so in, in that way, the volatility of stochastic discount factor uh, links to um, you know, changing to the risk neutral measure, right? So this is, this, is, this is another way how this can be done. But I'm, but I'm not doing it. Um, I'm just using this equation, this asset pricing condition, you know, st straight under the physical measure. Okay. So you can get the law of motion of um, eta. Okay. 
So um, I mentioned at the very beginning that this asset pricing relationship is very, very useful because you can use it to solve 60% um, of a microfinance model. So what is the remaining 40%? Is So these three bullet points are um, you know, the 60% because you can use it to uh, you know, r uh, solve for asset values. You can solve it for asset allocation. You can solve it for the evolution of wealth and wealth distribution. And then the two missing bits are, um, so endogenous risk, okay? Uh, that's one missing bit. Um, and uh, value functions, okay? Uh, and in some, in, you can write some models where you don't even have those, okay? And in fact, in, uh, in the example um, that I have prepared for you to do today, um, you don't have those. Uh, but there are also those bi uh, bits uh, to understand um, how to do. If you have a log utility, then log utility has um, these certain myopic properties that an individual always consumes rho times wealth, and that the uh, price of risk equals the um, volatility of wealth. And in that way, for log utility, you don't need to, to use the value functions. You can just use those myopic properties. But you know, for example, for CRRA utility or for Epstein's in utility, then um, you, know, you would solve for, for value functions. And to solve for value functions, um, in some cases, you can do it analytically, but typically, uh, it requires you know, going to the computer and uh, um, you know, if, you've, if you're solving the model, solving for the value functions using backward um, iteration. Okay. So there are also those two bits. Okay. So um, now, um, what I did so far is uh, I have used this asset pricing relationship to, and, and showed how to do um, you know, those first three bullet points. But you might ask me the question is, OK, so you know, we can do this, we can do this, we can do that. Like, now what's the big picture? How do we think about it you know, as, as a whole? Okay. And in order to think about this as a whole, um, let me take an example of um, a complete macro model, and let me actually you know, solve it from, from the beginning until the end. Um, and this is going to be model number one. And after I solve it, I'm going to show model number two, and I'm going to ask basically you to solve it. Okay. And that's going to be you know, two ways of looking at the big picture. And model number one is going to be the model that um, um, was already on one of my slides earlier. Um, the model from the uh, online lectures. Uh, let's take logarithmic utility and let's assume that uh, um, you cannot issue equity, but you can only issue debt. So um, any individual holding capital has to fully absorb the risk of this capital. And let's uh, solve this, the model. Okay. So what does it mean? to solve the model. In order to solve the model, we have to determine for any initial condition uh, and for any um, sequence of uh, aggregate shocks, what is it going to lead to? So um, starting from any initial condition, for example, the initial condition could be, let's say, that experts, they have 25% uh, um, of wealth and households have, have 75. So that's uh, that could be an initial condition for us. Um, and get some sequence of shocks. And after that sequence of shocks, we want to basically um, be able to tell everything after that sequence of shocks. What is going to be the price of capital? Um, is the economy going to be in crisis or not in crisis? Um, 
how the capital is allocated between uh, households and experts, what is going to be the risk of capital, and, and all of those uh, types of questions. Okay? So ultimately, it's a, uh, it's a map from uh, um, initial condition in the history of shock to the full description of the economy, the allocation of capital, the price of capital, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's what we want to determine. Okay. Um, and, um, but, you know, of course, log utility will make our, our lives easier. So, um, and, uh, how I'm going to solve it is I'm going to solve it first by uh, figuring out a map from uh, the state variable eta to the descriptors of the economy, uh, including the price of capital and the allocation of capital. And second, uh, by figuring out the equation how eta evolves. Okay. But first, uh, the map from eta, state variable, to the descriptors of, of the economy. Uh, so I wrote here two equations. One equation is uh, this just um, from, from this relationship for log utility, the market clearing condition for output. Here the left hand side is given the allocation of capital. This is the uh, total output in the economy per unit of capital. So this is the uh, supply of consumption. And the right-hand side is the demand of consumption. So a uh, fraction of wealth eta is experts. They want to consume rho times their wealth. Fraction 1 minus eta of wealth is households. They want to consume rho underlined of their wealth. And so the right-hand side is the demand for consumption. The right-hand side is the demand. The left-hand side is the supply. And this uh, equation is a uh, market clearing condition for consumption. Um, this equation is an equation that we already derived together. This is the allocation equation for, the, uh, for psi, the fraction of capital that experts hold. Okay. And then uh, um, endogenous risk, something that uh, Marcus has talked a lot uh, about in his lecture, but uh, we haven't done anything on that, is uh, asking the question about, well, what determines sigma q in a, in a model of this type? Um, and of course, sigma q depends on two things. So sigma q depends on, um, I guess, the volatility of, of state variable eta and the function how the price of capital Q depends on eta. So the volatility of eta is, uh, this is going to be the, the formula. So uh, this is the volatility of um, experts' wealth. And if you take the volatility of experts' wealth and we subtract the volatility of total wealth, then we get the volatility of eta. Um, so that's going to be uh, sigma eta. And then the, uh, this is the absolute volatility of Q, Q times sigma Q. And by eta's formula, this equals Q prime of eta times the absolute volatility of, of eta, sigma eta times eta. So it's, it's, it's this mu multiplied by eta. So we have this equation. So this is from eta's formula, and this is from uh, our earlier discussion about the law of motion of, of eta. Okay. Um, and it turns out that these three equations that are on the slide are sufficient to solve for what's going to happen in the economy for every single uh, eta, for every single value of the state variable eta. Okay. Um, and how? So suppose it 
So this is our state variable that goes from 0 to 1. And uh, at 0, we have a boundary condition because um, we know that if uh, uh, eta is equal to 0, then uh, uh, this equation, and then psi, so eta equals to 0 means that experts have no wealth. So therefore, uh, psi is also equal to 0. It means that experts cannot hold any capital if they have no wealth. And then this equation becomes just a, a, an equation with one unknown q. So we have a q of 0 for, um, at the boundary equal eta equal to 0. And we have psi equal to 0. Okay. So once we have this boundary condition, then these three equations, they give us um, uh, an ordinary differential equation for Q. So we have uh, OD for Q. Um, and in fact, uh, it's going to be a first order ordinary differential equation for Q. So what is the what does it mean, a first order ordinary differential equation for Q is that if we have a Q, then we, we need a procedure to find the Q prime of eta. So the first order ordinary differential equation, I'm not sure how much you can see this. This is probably blocked by the computer, right? So you cannot see this, OK. But. So we have. Q of eta at eta, the differential equation gives us uh, the value of Q prime. And then, uh, and then if, we, if we have the value of Q prime, then well, we can just, like, we can just uh, uh, find the Q prime, and then we can you know, find uh, uh, you know, the whole function Q by, by solving it. Okay. So and, and these three equations, they give us um, the first order ordinary differential equation. Well, how? So uh, we have a boundary condition, like I mentioned, at 0. And uh, this system gives us a way of finding q prime from eta and q. Okay, and, and how do we do it is, well, let's look at all of the equations. Uh, so there is equation 1. Uh, and if we know q and if we know eta, then this equation uh, can be solved for the unknown psi. So we use equation 1 to find psi. Okay. Now, psi we can plug into the next equation, which is equation 2. And here we know q, we know eta, we know psi, and we can find sigma q from equation 2. Um, and uh, then we have uh, uh, equation 3, which is, let's say, this equation, right? So we have q and we have sigma q, which we just found. And we have uh, psi and we have eta, and therefore we can find q prime, so we can find q prime. So this is a, this is a system that it's like, OK, you know, if you just like write it on the slide, it looks a little bit mis mysterious. But if you put it into computer mechanical, that you can program with line 1, line 2, line 3 to solve this uh, for q as a function of eta. And this also gives you uh, psi as a function of eta, and this gives you, um, you know, endogenous risk. Um, and uh, this gives you, you know, the whole solution how it depends um, on eta. And then you, you, if you put it in the computer, you get, you get a picture like this. You get a region where uh, psi is less than one, the um, and then the price is of capital becomes depressed, and then this is going to be the crisis region. Um, it, uh, if I also plotted sigma q, then this is going to be the region where, where sigma q spikes. And then you have a normal regime where um, the, all of the capital is allocated to experts. OK, and uh, so, OK, and is this a complete model solution? Well, this is almost a complete model solution because it tells us everything as a function of the state variable eta. And the only piece that's missing is finding the law of motion of eta. Okay. Uh, but that missing piece is uh, uh, you know how to do because uh, it, you can use just the asset pricing uh, relationship to 
to solve for the law of motion of eta here, um, and uh, uh, and that's basically that's basically whatever is on this slide. You, you just you just plug in. So if you just look at these two two equations here, you know everything except for the risk-free rate. Okay, but to find the law of motion of eta, you don't need to know the risk-free rate because it cancels out. <laughs> so so therefore, you can find the law of motion of eta. Okay, so therefore. This model is solved. Okay. Okay. Um, so now it's um, it's your turn to solve uh, another model, and don't worry, I'm going to break it down into you know small small bits. Um, so this model is a sister of the model that we just solved. Um, but it has some new interesting elements. And it also has some, uh, some extra assumptions which, which will make it um, simpler, easier to solve. So consider an economy in which there are households and experts. And before, we assumed that experts are more productive than households. But now, in uh, this version, they're equally productive. So they get the same output uh, from capital. Um, this is the law of motion of capital. And uh, capital is. Uh, subject to some aggregate risk. And also in this version of the model, capital also has some idiosyncratic risk. Um, now, how experts and households are going to be different in this model is there is going to be an assumption that uh, experts are not more productive at using capital, but they're uh, better at um, managing risk. So, uh, when households hold capital, they, they have to face this amount of idiosyncratic risk. But experts, they could somehow you know, hold different types of capital and better diversify. And so they can reduce the idiosyncratic risk. And the uh, experts, they face less idiosyncratic risk. So that's the difference, that the households, they face idiosyncratic risk sigma tilde. And experts, they face um, uh, they're better at risk managing the face idiosyncratic risk uh, phi sigma tilde. Um, okay, so um, both experts and households have logarithmic utility. Households, you know, have this type of a regular logarithmic utility with uh, discount factor rho, and. Um, there is going to be an assumption in this model that experts, they're going to have logarithmic utility with taste shocks. So instead of um, uh, just normal discounting here, uh, experts, they will, they will have some stochastic discounting of future utility. And how to think about it is that, well, um, So, so there, there are different economic interpretations for this. You, you could say that, well, um, you know, experts, they, um, they potentially um, you know, do other activities. And uh, maybe like banks, you know, they um, uh, you know, hold portfolios of loans. And they could somehow manage the risk of loans in that way. But at the same time, they also have some um, you know, investment banking or trading activities that expose them to, to other types of risk, and this is the source of, of that risk. Or, you know, um, or it could be that, um, you know, they're, they compete with other banks and uh, they um, have some, um, you know, profitable investment opportunities, and because of that, you know, they like to have, you know, consumption in some states better than others. So, you know, there are those taste shocks. Okay. 
Um, so the main difference from the previous model is going to be this idiosyncratic risk and the opportunity of uh, experts to diversify some of the idiosyncratic risk. Um, the second difference is going to be this, uh, the taste shocks. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm showing these taste shocks here is because uh, this is just like a useful trick. And if you're writing a model and if you want like in a, um, uh, in a sort of a cheap way to embed an assumption that um, um, one group of agents want to expose them to certain types of risks, well, this is one way to, to have that assumption. So it's just a useful modeling trick. Um, and then the last assumption that um, I'm going to make for this model is that the risk, uh, aggregate risk, is going to be tradable. Okay? So there's going to be no friction with respect to uh, sharing of aggregate risk. So the individuals, they, they could uh, basically trade derivative contracts with some price of aggregate risk. Uh, this is var sigma. Um, and so in this model, the price of aggregate risk, because aggregate risk is tradable, will be the same for experts and households. But in the previous model, that was not the case, uh, because in the previous model, uh, this is the price of risk of price of aggregate risk for experts, and this is the price of aggregate risk for households because of this financial friction. But, but now I'm taking this financial friction out. So the only financial friction, uh, so in place of that other financial friction, in this model the financial friction that's introduced is uh, with respect to um, uh, sharing of idiosyncratic risk. Okay. So this is the model that um, I'm going to ask you to solve, but now uh, let me show a slide with the big picture. So what we want to do. So for this model, we want to solve it. So we want to determine um, for any sequence of aggregate shocks in, in an initial condition, what is going to be the price of capital, what is going to be the allocation of capital, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and in order to solve it, we have to use our um, asset pricing relationship, um, which I started with. Um, and in fact, uh, the asset pricing relationship is a, is a hammer that can be used you know, in many different ways to, uh, to solve different parts of the model. And uh, to solve this particular model, you just need that, that one hammer. You don't also need the screwdriver. But, but for, um, you know, uh, but the, for some other models, you, you also need like other other tools as well. So uh, you you have just this one very powerful hammer. Okay. Um, so for this model, we want to solve for the price of capital. Uh, we want to solve for the allocation of capital, and to solve for the allocation of capital, you know this this is going to be similar to what we had before, except that of course the price of aggregate risk is. Uh, going to be the same for experts and households because aggregate risk is, is tradable. Okay. Uh, but in this asset pricing relationship, um, now what is different is that there are two types of risks. There is the aggregate risk of capital, and there is also the idiosyncratic risk. And the idiosyncratic risk is different between experts and households. Um, so of course, experts, because they're better at managing idiosyncratic risk. Uh, and then uh, this is the price of idiosyncratic risk. So the price of idiosyncratic risk just equals the uh, idiosyncratic volatility um, of experts or households. Um, uh, and then evolution of wealth distribution is also something that we need to do to solve this model. OK. So. Um, Now, the very first bullet point, the price of capital, because uh, experts and households are equally productive, 
the uh, total output per unit of capital is just the right hand side. This is the demand for capital. And so uh, if you just stare at this equation, uh, you can tell me right away that um, one particular feature of this model is going to be that uh, the price of capital is constant, like in Basak and Coco. So in this particular model, uh, you know, unfortunately, we will not have any um, endogenous risk because of that. But uh, that's OK, because uh, we just solved the model with endogenous risk, so we know how to do endogenous risk. OK. So um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, um, try to solve this model. Um, and I'm going to ask a series of questions in order to solve. By the way, um, you know, because I'm asking you to solve it, um, let me ask if uh, this model is clear or if you have any co clarifying questions about it. And, and while you think about clarifying questions, I need to give you a number. So the number I need to give you is If I write here, you can see it. 907.155 is the number. OK. Any clarifying questions? OK, so, th so then let's, let's go to the, to the, the first question. Um, what is the price of aggregate risk for households and experts um, N lower bar denotes the household's total wealth, and N denotes the expert's total wealth. Okay, and think about which one you would choose. And I'm going to actually ask uh, all of you to to answer it if you have a, a mobile phone. Um, so you should go on your mobile phone, and it, uh, this is completely anonymous, by the way. So you know, <laughs> if you if you get the, you go to Slido. S L I dot D O. Okay. And then uh, it's going to ask you which poll to participate in, and you put in this number. Okay. So um, the correct answer is C. Okay. <laughs> so some of you are like, okay, they, they got it. So uh, you got it. So fantastic. So, let, so let, let me let, let me explain. This is this is a little bit tricky because there are a lot of like you know signs going on. Okay. So let me let me explain what's going on. Okay. I guess with multiple choice questions, one of the ways to approach it is to just like rule out some incorrect choices so that you don't have to fully understand it. Uh, uh, okay, so um, the price of risk is uh, the compensation that you know an investor requires to be convinced to take that risk. Okay. Um, if you're already exposed to this risk, then you require more compensation. So the price of risk for a standard log utility agent like household is just the volatility of wealth. Okay. So uh, the more risk the agent is exposed to, proportionately you require they require more risk to to take more. And so um, because of that, the price of risk for households is a uh, uh, Sigma uh, n underlined. So the the, uh, the correct answer is by judging by that is either C or D or E. Okay. Um, and uh, A and B. This is the volatility of marginal utility. Okay. By the way, so. Um, Uh, wealth is n underlined. 
consumption is C underlined proportional to wealth. So the volatility of C underlined is the same as the volatility of wealth. But the, the volatility of 1 over C underlined marginal utility is minus that, so, uh, which, which also equals to minus uh, C under, underlined. So this is the volatility of marginal utility, right? So this is, um, yeah. Um, and uh, the price of risk is minus the volatility of uh, marginal utility. Okay. So if this is the volatility of marginal utility, then this is the price of risk minus the volatility of marginal utility. So that's for households. Now what about for experts? So for experts, this is their utility. Their marginal utility is um, zeta t divided by ct. Um, and the volatility of that is uh, sigma zeta minus sigma c, OK? And sigma c, I can also write sigma n in place of it, because those are the same. Um, and the price of risk is minus that. So notice that uh, uh, sigma zeta and sigma c come with the opposite signs, OK? So sigma zeta and sigma n have to come in opposite signs in our answer. And so th therefore, which one is the right one, this one or this one? Well, this is the right one, because they have to come in the opposite sign. Okay? And, uh, and that's, th that's the math. But the intuition is um, this is the price of risk for households, and this is the price of risk for experts. You subtract this. Okay? And why you subtract this? So they have a lower price of risk than sigma n, because they have, a, they have taste shocks. They have taste shocks because they like this risk. So, so you have to subtract the volatility of that from, uh, um, from, uh, from their price of risk, and that's why it's, it's a minus sign. So C is the, C is the correct answer, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I guess this is just like a summary of everything that I just said. So this is the marginal utility. This is the marginal utility. Um, this is, uh, this is their uh, price of risk. This is the household's price of risk. And our notation for the price of risk is var, var sigma. So uh, they, can, they can trade this risk. So the price of risk, this one equals that, equals whatever it is in the derivatives market to hedge this risk. Okay. So we have this relationship. Um, and we can actually derive. What, what this var sigma has to be in equilibrium from that. Because how? Because one of the tricks that uh, often works in uh, heterogeneous agent models is that you uh, look at some relationship for the different type of agent, and then you take the, the weighted average with the weights equal to the uh, wealth share weights. Okay? So if you take the weighted average of this with the wealth share weights, then this is the expert's wealth share. This is the household's wealth share. So uh, you get the uh, weighted average of total uh, risk, which is equal to sigma, because uh, sigma is the, the total risk to the, to the whole economy. And there is no additional um, endogenous risk. So you have sigma. And then you have minus eta times uh, uh, sigma, sigma zeta. And, and so, therefore, here we get in, a, uh, clo in closed form, what is the price of aggregate risk in this economy? And if we get what is the price of aggregate risk in this economy in closed form, then we also have in closed form the allocation of uh, aggregate risk. Okay. So, so therefore, what you just uh, solved by answering this question is you solved uh, a part of solving this model, which is the allocation of aggregate risk. But allocation of aggregate risk here is separate from the allocation of capital because there is no uh, friction. And so the next thing that you have to do to continue solving this model is to actually look at the um, allocation of capital. And uh, allocation of capital here will be guided by uh, idiosyncratic risk. Um, and this question is asking you, 
And I have to restart the poll, so don't answer it yet. Um, so I have to do this. And then um, reset results. Yes, reset. And let me run the poll again. So now I'm running the poll for, for this uh, uh, question, um, which is asking you about the uh, price of idiosyncratic risk for uh, experts. For some reason, I call them entrepreneurs in this slide, let's say experts of entrepreneurs and households. Okay, um, going once, going twice, and going uh, three times. And now um, I can tell you what the answer is. And 83% uh, of you said that the answer is B. And congratulations. The correct answer is indeed, uh, is indeed B, okay? So, uh, so it, I think you got it, but you know, just for the sake of completeness, let me um, you know g give you the explanation. You can probably explain it to me, but you know, just uh, uh, you know, just to be sure. So, um, these are log utility agents, and um, when it comes to idiosyncratic risk, they're just pure log because uh, they're only aggregate shocks to these state shocks for the for the experts. So um, the price of idiosyncratic risk comes from the exposure uh, of wealth or consumption to idiosyncratic risk. Um, and those are proportionate. Um, and this is the exposure of experts to idiosyncratic risk, because this is how much capital they hold that gives them idiosyncratic risk. This is their wealth. And this is per unit of capital how much idiosyncratic risk there is. And for households, this is a symmetric expression. This is the fraction of capital that they hold. This is the fraction their wealth share. And this is, uh, they get a higher amount of idiosyncratic risk per unit of capital. So B is the right answer. Congratulations. OK. Um, so the next question is, uh, um, I'm not going to give you any uh, multiple choice question. But um, I am going to give you uh, maybe a few minutes, just a couple, five minutes. I'm not, no, no. Um, and this is a question about the allocation of, of capital in this economy, psi as a function of eta. So to solve for psi as a function of eta. And just a, a hint of uh, how to do it is you'll have to use the asset pricing relationship for capital for experts and for households. And you know, here they are. Um, and then use these two equations to derive psi as a function of eta. So let me give you a chance to just you know, work it out and um, uh, derive it. Uh, and at the end, um, you know, there is a brave person to to just give me the answer, then, um, then you can give me the answer. And you can see that you know, we are solving the model. We are, we are grinding it you know, step by step. Um, in general, when, just something I, I, I wanted to say, this has always been in my mind. Um, whenever you're trying to solve something, um, one good strategy I find is um, like solving something that are easy parts and then there are difficult parts. Um, and whenever, sometimes, you know, whenever we try to solve something, right away we start thinking about the difficult parts because we worry about, you know, whether we will be able to do those difficult parts. Um, and uh, uh, one good suggestion for solving the model is, uh, you know, do everything easy that you can do first without worrying about the difficult parts. 
Because after you do the easy part, you might actually get an idea of how to do the difficult part once you know the answer to the, the easy part. And this is the same with this model that, you know, maybe you want to, uh, you're worried whether you'll be able to solve the whole model or not, but, you know, let's do it little by little and, uh, and then see what, what's left. And then maybe if you have some, something very difficult to solve, then, you know, don't bang your head against the wall. Maybe go take a shower or go on a, on a long walk and, and uh, let it just be there. And hopefully you'll wake up and see the answer. So was anybody able to obtain the formula yet? Still need a bit more time? I guess some of you. You have, you have, some of you have the formula? Yeah? You have, you have a brave soul to, okay. We have, do we have a brave soul to tell me the, the formula? You can raise your hand if, if you're willing to. Okay, uh, so let, 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 me ask, let me ask this question. Uh, uh, can you tell me first, uh, um, before telling me the formula, what's the approach here? How to, how to solve it, yes? Subtract two equations from each other. Yeah, subtract the two equations from each other, and after you, you subtract, then I think we, uh, we had the volunteer, what's your name? Nabi. Nabi, okay, yes, yeah, I should remember your name by now, but. Uh, uh, this just gives me another opportunity to remember it. Uh, so it's, uh, sorry, let me write it down. So it's uh, eta over. That's phi over rho. That's phi. Uh, phi, right? Phi. I think psi squared 1 plus eta plus. Sorry, one minus eta plus plus eta, right? One minus eta plus eta. That's the that's the formula, right? Okay, and this is this is this is exactly right. So um, we sub, uh, uh, I guess both both of them are equal to zero. So if you set them equal to each other, then you know all of this cancels out. This is equal to to that. We get this, and then after that, just you know algebra. You know all of you can do this algebra, um, and then. Uh, we get a uh, psi. Yeah, so solving things also, you know, very often, um, it's, it's important to understand, like, what's the key to, to solving something, okay? And, and, um, and that's the fun part, right? Um, and here, I guess the key is just you know to to see that um, that you have to uh, write the asset pricing relationship for X person for households, and then from that get the allocation. Um, and then there is also the algebra part, which you know sometimes you know takes a little bit of time, you know especially for people like me that tend to make a lot of mistakes, uh, and that's that's the boring part. But but in general, you know whenever you're trying to um, attack something. A good first step is to formulate, okay, you know, what's the strategy to, to solve it? Um, once you have laid out this, this strategy, then you go into, you know, the mode of, you know, actually uh, cranking it, right? But, uh, but it's useful to, you know, formulate it very clearly for yourself what strategy do you use to solve something. And sometimes when you're doing research, um, you don't even need to go to the second step. Because it's like, oh, you know, I can solve it. Um, you know, this is my approach to solving it. Now, instead of you know spending you know two days to solve it, let me actually figure out how useful it is. You know, whether it's useful or not, um, and then you know if you figure out that it's that it's actually you know useful for for something else, then then you go ahead and, and you solve it. So you can try to you know time yourself that way. 
OK. So but where are we so far? So so far, we are in great shape because, um, because um, we figured out, as a function of eta, what is the price of capital in this model. And that, that the equation gives us the price of capital that's constant. And we figured out, as a function of eta, what is the allocation of um, aggregate risk. So this slide answers this, this question. And we figured out, as a function of eta, what is the allocation of uh, capital. So by the way, you know, uh, th this question that you, all of you, almost all of you answered, you know, allows us to write these two equations. So from these two equations, you told me what is the allocation of capital. Okay. So now we know everything as a, as a function of eta. To, and this is what we also did for the previous model. Um, and now we just need to figure out uh, the law of motion of eta to, to have a complete uh, solution of this model. So the thing that's left is to figure out what is the law of motion of, uh, of eta, the, the expert's wealth share. Um, and, and that's the evolution of wealth distribution. And what do we use to solve for the evolution of the wealth distribution? Well, the fundamental asset pricing relationship. Okay? So let's write down the um, uh, law of motion of wealth of experts and law of motion of wealth of you know, either households or total in order to get this uh, asset pricing relationship. Okay? So question four is, if we have a risk-free rate, um, and from uh, the, what, what you did so far, we know the allocation of uh, capital, and we know the allocation of aggregate risk. Um, this question asks you, what is the law of motion of, of experts' wealth? OK. Um, so the correct answer is B. And 79% uh, of you have answered B. So congratulations. Um, and uh, let me explain why B is the correct answer. So what's the principle here? Is that, oh, you know, the law of motion of wealth is you earn the risk-free rate, uh, plus you take on some risk, and you earn some risk premium. Um, and uh, you consume out of your wealth, so you have to subtract uh, consumption. And, and so because you have to subtract consumption, um, A is not correct because it forgets to subtract consumption. Okay? So those are the, the, the only uh, three remaining uh, possibilities. So, so then we have, this is law of motion of total experts' wealth. Um, so for individual, we also have some idiosyncratic risk. But idiosyncratic risk uh, cancels out in the aggregate, so that's why we don't have idiosyncratic risk. And now, uh, how much um, uh, how much uh, aggregate risk experts are exposed to is that well, this this is what we already solved for, so this it just tells us. So therefore, you know, D isn't correct. It would be D in case. Um, uh, idiosyncratic risk in case aggregate risk was not you know, f freely traded. But because it's freely traded, it's either uh, B or C. And now we have to say, OK, well, on this aggregate risk, there is going to be a risk premium uh, var sigma, because that's by definition is the, the price of risk. So therefore, uh, just from that, B is the right answer. Um, and just to make sure that B is completely correct, is that while well, this is the uh, idiosyncratic risk uh, times the price of idiosyncratic risk, which equals the uh, idiosyncratic risk. So this is the idiosyncratic risk of expert squared. Okay. So that's um, uh, question two asks you what is the risk of idiosyncratic risk of expert. So so B is the correct answer. Okay. Um, 
And we are after the law of motion of wealth shares, so uh, the, the numerator is n, the denominator is q times k, and now we have to figure out the law of motion of q times k in order to get the law of motion of, of eta, okay? And here's a question, um, and I, I'm gonna give you a chance to uh, uh, think about it. Let me re reset the poll. And, uh, yep, so this is the question, the denominator for eta. Okay, so I see 29 answers so far. Um, so let me give, give you a chance, if you still have an answer, to answer this question. Okay, going once, going twice, going three times. Okay, so um, I want to congratulate uh, all of you. Uh, however, the right answer is, uh, is D, all of the above, okay? And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trick question because it's like, oh, you know. <laughs> these equations, these expressions, expressions, they look so different from each other. And, and it turns out that, uh, and actually there is a reason why, why I wrote it. I'll explain, give you the reason why I wrote it this way. But um, D is the correct answer, all of the above. Um, very, very few people have answered uh, D uh, so uh, 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 let me just, let's do a show of hands if you answer D. So, um, you know, uh, don't, don't be shy, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> congratulations, okay. Um, okay, so let me explain what's going on. So uh, it's the law of motion of total wealth and there are different approaches, okay? So um, one approach is just, um, It just use Ito's formula, right? So B is, uh, B is, is if you have the law, law of motion of Q, uh, if you have the law of motion of K, then you just use Ito's product rule that Marcus has uh, showed and you get this expression. And so the, by that, this is, this is correct. So B is clearly a correct answer. And then A is, um, well, by market clearing, this is equal to that. So, so A is also true. But another way to look at A is, um, so this is the uh, total return on capital, including the capital gains rate and including the dividend yield. So this is the total return on total wealth. And from total return, you subtract uh, how much of the wealth you take out to consume, which is rho, uh, and therefore this is the total return minus the consumption rate. So you can also look at it that way. So that's, uh, that's A. And then C is, um, well, um, C is also correct. And let me, let me uh, explain what's going on here. So um, this is the risk of uh, households. This is the aggregate risk of, uh, of experts. If you take the weighted average, putting weight uh, eta on, uh, on experts and one minus eta on households, then you get this uh, total risk. So therefore, this is the correct expression for, for total risk. Okay, this must equal that. Okay. Um, so this is the correct expression for total risk. Now, if you're holding the world wealth portfolio, this is the aggregate risk that you face, and this is the price of aggregate risk that you earn and the aggregate risk that, that you face. And then, if, and then if you hold that portfolio, then uh, uh, fraction uh, eta of total wealth is invested by the experts who earn some uh, 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 premium on idiosyncratic risk. So this expression is just the same expression as we had on the previous slide. Um, this, is, this is this term, except we take a weighted average of this term for experts and the, and the, and, and the same one for households. Uh, so this is multiplied by eta is, um, um, is this one. 
and this is the, uh, an analogous term for households multiplied by um, uh, one minus theta. So this is the, the earning for uh, taking the idiosyncratic risk by experts, and this is ha households earning for their uh, taking on the idiosyncratic risk. And of course, we are dividing wealth uh, into a portion invested by experts and a portion invested by households. So this is just accounting for the total world portfolio and attaching the, all of the um, risk premia to the different parts of the uh, world portfolio. So this is, the C is correct, OK? Um, and now um, we want to uh, get the law of motion of eta, right? And the, the, let me just ask you the question, which equation would you use to derive the law of motion of eta? So do you have three correct answers. Which one would you use to derive the law of motion of eta? A, B, or C? C, C, OK. You use C. And the, why do you use C? Because it's written in the same language as, um, as that one, as the previous one, OK? Um, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's written, you know, starting from uh, uh, taking into account, okay, how much risk is there? What is the price of risk? What does that imply about the law of motion of wealth? So this is using the asset pricing relationship, okay? And then uh, um, using uh, the answer to question four, and using this one, we can derive the law of motion of eta. So I'll give you a chance to do that. But, uh, um, but first of all, let me make a point that, OK, now this illustrates the usefulness of this uh, uh, asset pricing principle that I introduced at the, at the beginning. Because imagine you write you know, like a multi-sector economy. So you want to uh, address a particular type of a macrofinance question. You write an economy with different sectors. One sector has you know, one particular technology that it uses to make profit. Another sector uses another uh, technology to make uh, profit. And then you want to see you know, how the wealth distribution of the economy evolves. And suppose you try to do it uh, using information about the technologies that these sectors use. So if you use information about the technologies, then it becomes a nightmare because one sector is using one technology, um, another sector is using another technology. It looks like you're comparing apples to oranges. So you have, you know, but, but if you do it uh, based on the, the asset pricing principle that, oh, you know, uh, a, any technology has a certain amount of risk, and this risk has to earn an appropriate uh, um, uh, price of risk. Now you're comparing apples to apples. So that's why um, you know, asset, this asset pricing principle that uh, I've introduced uh, at the very beginning is, is so useful, uh, not just uh, because it's a powerful tool, but because um, you know, it's, uh, it's so uniform in, in the application that it makes it convenient. To, to use. And um, I'm talking from experience because I have tried solving these models based on you know, uh, uh, t t equations that, that of this form that you know, give return as a function of technology. And then, yeah, eventually get to the same answer. <laughs> but it just takes so much longer. Um, OK. So, uh, Question six, and uh, we're almost done, is uh, to derive the law of motion of eta. And uh, um, I'll just give you five minutes to, you know, to um, work on it. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, it's going to be a fairly complicated equation, so I'll just show the answer to everybody. OK, uh, so um, you know, why, why don't, uh, uh, why don't uh, we do it? Um, 
like, do you, you feel like you need more time, or you feel like you know it's like okay, you know, you 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 have the right approach. Just if you if you had more time, you you could finish it. Maybe you didn't finish it. Okay, so let's uh, let's do it. So. So here we have a formula, Ito's formula for the ratio. And let's just start with this term because this is a useful term. It also enters there. Okay. So this is just the difference between the volatility. So we are going to have, uh, if you take the difference, it's going to be um, 1 minus eta sigma zeta dz. Right? So we're going to have this term in there. Okay. And then. Um, so that's that. And then we have this term here, which is minus sigma y, which is uh, var sigma t plus eta sigma zeta. So that's uh, uh, sigma y, the denominator, times uh, um, that term, the difference, 1 minus eta sigma zeta dt. So we have that. Okay. So we took care of this term, we took care of that term. And now we have uh, this term here. So what is that going to be is that, well, we take the difference between the drifts. Uh, these two are going to cancel out conveniently. You know, they're the same in both. Uh, taking the difference here is that, well, this is the difference in risk times the price of risk. So that's going to be the difference in risk is, uh, is again, the same one, 1 minus eta sigma zeta times uh, var sigma t, that's the price of risk. So that's, uh, and it's with the plus sign. So that's um, these two terms. And then um, we have um, uh, this expression. And then we have this expression, which, um, you know, this already tells you that it's equal to this by, um, you know, this allocation of capital. Uh, and so uh, taking the difference, we get what? We get uh, psi over eta is common uh, times psi over eta minus 1, minus eta over eta times phi squared sigma tilde squared dt. So that's uh, taking the difference between these two. Okay. Um, and now if you just look at it, uh, something simplify so this term here uh, cancels out that term over there this times times that okay um, and then we get uh, the expression uh, we can plug in for uh, for psi you know to uh, to do it further and in the end we get uh, this answer okay so I try to do it you know uh, as efficiently as possible, this is the this is the final answer, and this is completely closed form tells us uh, the law of motion of eta. And what's the economic intuition here? The economic intuition here is that this the drift has a positive term. Um, so um, it's a positive term. Idiosyncratic risk helps experts earn some wealth because they're better at. Uh, managing idiosyncratic risks in households. This is a negative term because uh, experts, you know, they want to take on some of the aggregate risk for whatever reasons, and so they pay the households to expose themselves to, to this risk. Um, and because of that, um, I guess eta, the drift is going to be, you can tell that it's going to be positive near eta equal to 0, and I think negative near eta equal to, to 1. Or maybe it depends on parameters. Um, uh, it, but we have a positive and a negative. Um, and then we have, we have some volatility. So, you know, so then this is something that you, know, uh, you can put into um, a computer to uh, generate a graph. And then uh, you get this uh, allocation of, of capital in this economy. Um, that experts, they hold more than half of the capital. But households, you know, they also hold some. Um, this is the uh, volatility. So this is what it would look like without endogenous risk. And then if you modify this model somehow to allow for endogenous risk, then you could potentially get something more interesting. And this is the drift. So you see that um, 
you know, there's a, there's a positive drift here, there's a negative drift here, and so uh, there's going to be, you know, uh, the economy will gravitate to, towards this point, right? So it's a, it's a nice uh, uh, example. Um, and uh, at this point, um, you know, I'm uh, uh, ready to finish. But uh, because we have uh, Andre uh, in the audience, and uh, Andre is also the first name of uh, uh, Kolmogorov, <laughs> uh, there is a bonus question. You know, if you want, you can uh, try to uh, you know s solve it. Uh, you know, tonight or tomorrow will give you the answer. Uh, and and this is about the, the stationary distribution for for this particular uh, model. So. Um, uh, if you have a process like process eta with some Markov process, then uh, a Kolmogorov forward equation gives us how the uh, density over the different uh, points eta evolves going forward. And uh, for a Markov process like this, uh, the stationary density has a closed form solution. This is a closed form solution where uh, the constant is unknown and uh, um, uh, it's pinned down by the condition that the density has to integrate to one. Okay, and um, um, so you can apply this to ask the question: Well, under what conditions does the stationary distribution exist? Okay, um, and uh, um, the, the bonus question is to figure out that condition. And for the, if you if you want to t take a crack at it. Um, you should uh, write down this equation and take it home with you. Okay. So, thank you. Um, oh, tomorrow, uh, as you see on the Princeton Initiative program, um, y there's there's more and more. Um, it goes more and more into topic the topic of money, right? And because of that, uh, what we're going to do tomorrow, what I'm going to do tomorrow in, in my session is, uh, um, I think it's scheduled to be two hours, but you know, two hours is a long time. I think tomorrow I'll try to make it a little bit shorter. So you, know, you can go and talk to each other, spend more time with each other, because that's, that's the point of being here. So you meet each other and, and talk to each other. Uh, but what I'm going to do tomorrow is uh, to do exactly the same exercise but introduce money into the same economy and see what's going to be different. And that's going to be interesting to do. Yep.